I, I really like that you mentioned that uh, puberty uh, situation, which shocked me when I heard it. And I just wrote down something here. Research shows that girls are going through puberty earlier in the 1800s and early 1900s. The average age of puberty for girls was 12 to 14 years old. Now it's 9 to 11 years old. A large U.S. study showed that 23% of black girls, 15% of Hispanic girls, and 10% of white girls were showing signs of breast development by age 7. So, I mean, that these stats are, there's a lot of them that mm -hmm. kind of blow you away. So I'm curious mm -hmm. to know, like, what do you think is going on here? I mean, I think that it's a combination of things, right? So one is that, you know, exposure to endocrine disrupting compounds is absolutely um, affecting fertility. I mean, in, 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 in sort of, in, in when I say fertility, um, here I'm talking about in the context of when people enter puberty, right? And, um, and if you're getting exposed to endocrine disrupting compounds, you're going to have earlier puberty. Um, if you're getting xenoestrogens bombarding your system. Um, other things going on, number two, is excess body weight. Um, so adiposity um, creates estrogen, right? So um, fat, in addition to all the other things that it does, is an endocrine, works as an endocrine organ in the body, and it causes the release of estrogens. And what this means is that it lowers male fertility, which is one of the reasons that we're seeing male fertility so low, is that their testosterone is being aromatized through this, um, this compound called aromatase, which um, transfers it into estrogen. And you get that in the context of high body weight. And then in girls, you just get really high levels of estrogen, right? So they are also aromatizing their testosterone and um, and then they're having, you know, these higher levels of estrogen. And so these girls are getting exposed to more estrogen earlier, which is then, you know, kicking them off down a path of early pubertal development, right? So adipose tissue also creates estrogen, which then can contribute to these different patterns. And then lastly, there's a, lot, there's a whole body of research that shows that psychosocial stress, especially um, this, the type of stress that you encounter in your early childhood environment, also plays a role in girls' pubertal timing, and that girls who grow up in unpredictable environments or environments where there's not an investing father, that these types of environments tend to promote early puberty in girls. And the idea is that what's happening is with these types of cues, that it's sending women's nervous system or young girls' nervous system this idea that the environment is unsafe male investment is unpredictable. And so the best sort of life history strategy that you can have is one where you reproduce early, right, just in case you don't survive very long, right? Because whenever you have an environment where there's a lot of unpredictability and lack of male investment, this suggests that this is, you know, not a great environment for survival, right? This isn't um, the type of environment where you wait and have a baby at 32 and, you know, because you, you don't know what's going to happen next. Unpredictability, lack of um, paternal care are both related to um, environmental uh, uncertainty. And that then sort of shunts girls into what we call like a faster life history strategy. And so there's also a lot of research indicating that lack of male investment, unpredictability because of things like poverty, um, these different types of features of the environment also, also predict early pubertal timing in girls. And so you put all of these things together which is what you get in some of these cases of very early pubertal development. And it's kind of a perfect storm, right? If you have somebody who is living in poverty and they don't have an investing dad, and because they're living in poverty, they're eating a lot of processed foods, they're getting exposure to a lot of chemicals, right? They're not getting the types of foods that tend to detoxify, um, you know, these uh, endocrine disrupting compounds. You have excess adiposity, which is also creating um, xenoestrogens and storing them because that's the other thing that body fat does is it stores these all of this garbage, right? So all of the toxins and stuff um, that we come encounter with or into contact with gets stored in body fat, which is just another reason that having excess adipose tissue isn't healthy for us. And then if you're also in an unpredictable environment that is sort of shunting you down this fast life path anyway, I mean, it's, it's a perfect storm for early puberty. Ah, so are we seeing that in, in certain countries that are kind of quote unquote developed, this early puberty mm -hmm. is happening more than maybe a country that is uh, rural, um, third world, maybe not, maybe a place where the fathers are living in the home with the family? Yeah, so what's really interesting is that it really does depend, you know, the the, the father absence effects on early pubertal timing 
does seem to be um, particularly uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a like a like a catalyst for early puberty, specifically in the context of environmental unpredictability. So if you're in an unpredictable environment, um, you know, with an absent father, that this can kind of shift you down this faster path. If you're in an environment that's more characterized by predictability, even if you have poverty. Um, that that tends to actually slow things down, right? Because it's essentially sending different signals to the brain. In one set of signals, it's just like, okay, there's not a lot of resources, but we know that everything is consistent. So I can make a, I can forecast about what things are going to be like in the future, right? And things are going to be tough, but they're going to be, you know, I'll probably be alive. And in those contexts, we actually sometimes will see delayed puberty. But in environments that are unpredictable and poor, Um, you tend to see earlier puberty. And it all has to do with the amount of sort of stochasticity um, within an environment. And so like, are you able to make predictions about what's going to happen tomorrow based on what happened today? And if the answer to that is no, then that's the type of environment that tends to promote early puberty. Yeah, that's well said. It, It seems that makes perfect sense because we're living in a time where it seems like change is happening more and more rapidly. And if the world never changed, we wouldn't need to reproduce. You could just live forever mm-hmm. because you're, you know, nothing's changing. So there's no need for an organism to change. But because the world does change, reproduction is kind of like the best way to adapt to an ever changing world. Cause like you're taking, you're mixing your genes with, mm-hmm. you know, in, to ensure survival. And so it seems like this early puberty is almost a response to this rapid change, this heightened stress because it's like we need to mix our genes to adapt to this ever-changing world faster and faster and faster. Right. And it's like, it's like, okay, like I don't um, you know, I don't know if I'll be around tomorrow, right? Because everything is changing and and you know, and who knows. Um, and in in those types of contexts, you know, the biological imperative is pass my genes on before I die. Right. And so if um there's cues that you don't really even know that you're going to make it, you know, then it makes sense to that you should be ready to reproduce sooner rather than later. So that way you can go ahead and pass your genes on to the next generation before something terrible happens to you. It sounds like we're in the perfect storm of not being able to reproduce very well because we have this, this turmoil on the women's side. And then on the male side, we have this low testosterone kind of, uh, no sperm count, I know. can't get out of the house type of deal. Yeah, no, it's like it's our, our hormones are really a mess right now. And and part of it is, you know, these endocrine disrupting compounds is noted. noted. Part of it is excess adiposity. So body fat is also a complete, you know, it'll totally dysregulate hormones. And that's part of the picture. Um, yeah. And then you've got these environment, these quickly changing environments that are sending in some ways conflicting signals about you know, what the body is supposed to be doing. And then also, and this might be kind of a controversial hot take, um, but I also wonder whether or not the blending of gender roles is also playing a role in terms of shifting our sex hormones. Um, And I'm not saying this in a way where I'm saying that this is bad because, you know, we don't want to fall prey to the naturalistic fallacy, which tells us, like, if it's natural, it's good. And, you know, if there's any societal intervention on something biological, it means it's bad because I don't think that that's true. I don't think that the fact that we have less demarcated gender roles is bad. It's just something that may have unintended consequences. And one of those unintended consequences may be that it it's shifting our hormones a little bit. And and the reason I make this hot take or I take this hot take is because, you know, we know from research and we talked about this at the top of the hour is that um, when men are doing more caregiving, that their bodies put a they tap the brakes on testosterone production because it is counterproductive to be producing high levels of testosterone when you're caring for kids. Um, you should be more patient and, you know, and not distracted by sex and like really focused on the kids. And um, and so we know from research that when men are engaged in more caregiving, their testosterone is a little bit lower. And men are doing more caregiving now than they've ever done before in history. And so, yeah, so that is probably contributing in some ways to men's lower levels of testosterone. 
And then women, you know, are are doing a lot more male typical things like, you know, spending a lot of time in the office and doing these work related things, which are not necessarily increasing their testosterone, although they may be. And that's a that's an empirical question I don't have an answer to. But it's certainly stressing women out, right, because they're feeling like they're having to be at home and they're having to be at work. And this has the effect of suppressing ovulation in a lot of cases, which is the way that women's bodies make most of their sex hormones. And so, you know, I have no doubt that our changing gender roles have, you know, also been contributing to some of the hormonal changes we've seen societally with men's testosterone levels being low and women um, having higher rates of infertility um, simply because stress is not necessarily um, productive in terms of ovulation. Yeah, I saw this interesting meme recently that showed uh, 1960s, women want to work. 1980s, men and women are working. 2000s, men and women have to work. 2020s, women have to work and men don't want to work. It it was like the trajectory of the two um, have changed courses quite a bit. 